Okay, good. So one of the key premises of critical theory is that power is both the driving force of human action and the primary reason or the primary principle that explains how societies develop and change. Remember, this is an idea that we got by looking at the works of Nietzsche, right? His kind of controversial metaphysics of the will to power, that power is driving everything and everything wants to cultivate and exercise power. And we see this theme a lot in the writings of Foucault as well, who tried to explain why it is we have the knowledge that we do and how that knowledge is actually constructed and exercised as a means of social control. How, do, how does critical theory see how people understand society? Do we have an accurate understanding of society, generally? Is the way I see society, is that exactly how it works? No. No. Right? There's this idea in critical theory that, especially if you're a part of the dominant culture or dominant interests, which I am because I'm a white man, that there's a false consciousness that pervades society. And that this false consciousness, this uh, untrue way of viewing things, that doesn't get everything right, that misses how oppression, the, the forms that oppression takes and the social groups that experience oppression, this false consciousness must be done away with by studying critical theory. What does it mean, or what's another word for awakening to what they call critical consciousness? Dispelling the illusions that you have of how society works. There is a word. Whoa. Whoa, that's right. When you're awoken to critical consciousness, another word for that is to be woke. So we see, or we are going to see in today's lecture, that the critical race theory that we're going to be looking at is going to be based on these premises. And it's going to be trying to reveal to us the way society actually works. Because our understanding is probably warped and mistaken. Because we're not coming from a critical theory standpoint when we first approach these problems. Because society conditions us into having a certain view of things that are really only in service of the dominant culture or the dominant interests, this false consciousness. Now, there's a phrase that critical uh, theories are sometimes called, especially by those on the right side of the political aisle. Have any of you heard of this phrase, cultural Marxism? Is this something any of you have heard of before? No. You've heard of it? I, I can Generally, when people on the right or others who are criticizing critical theory, when they use this phrase cultural Marxism, what they're trying to get across is this idea that what critical theory ultimately is, is the Marxian analysis of oppression applied to culture. So remember, Marx thought that everything could be explained in terms of people's economic situations. Right? The driving force of history can be explained or it can be reduced to an economic analysis. When we were looking at critical theory two lectures ago, remember the Frankfurt School discovered that no, framing things purely in an economic analysis isn't a holistic explanation of what's going on and why these systems get reproduced. So they decided to take the conflict theory that Marx developed and they, instead of engaging in economic criticism, started engaging in cultural criticism. That's what this phrase is supposed to denote. This idea that the Marxian analysis of oppression is now being applied in the cultural sphere, to critique of culture.
So if you ever hear somebody use this phrase, unless they're trying to denote some sort of conspiracy, what they mean is the Marxian analysis of oppression applied to culture. Okay, so that's just kind of a summary of some of the main aspects of critical theory in general. What we're going to be doing in this first lecture is we're going to be looking at a particular kind of critical theory, and that is critical race theory, which again, is it's going to be a little controversial. Um, so I'm going to go through it, kind of say what I have to say, and then we can have a discussion about whether or not we think it's right. I'm going to start by going over some of the fundamental concepts and ideas in critical race theory. And I'm going to abbreviate critical race theory CRT. The first fundamental idea that you need to internalize if you're going to understand what critical race theory says is this idea that the category of race isn't actually real. It's not tied to anything biological, but rather it's a social construction that white people basically came up with in order to give themselves power and exclude non-whites from power. So the critical race theorists are going to look at some of that fake race science that came out of um, the Enlightenment and that people were engaging in after the Enlightenment that said, oh, you can figure out what kind of race somebody is by measuring their skull, right, phrenology, or you can, um, we can see what somebody's race is by looking at their bone structure and these types of things. And they're going to say that Race was just kind of a category that white people came up with so that they could justify their enslavement and bad treatment of non-whites. So for example, um, if you're white and you think that other races are inferior, that obviously gives you a justification for enslaving them or doing other bad things to them, right? If you see another race as subhuman, then that's justification for not treating them like another human being, right? And so that's what the critical race theorists are going to hone in on. They're going to say, look, this idea of race was something that white people just made up so they could justify treating other races however they want. Now, I'd like to provide a quote from the chapter that I had you read for today, because it outlines some of the fundamental ideas in critical race theory. This is from page three of that first chapter. Unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. So I'm going to write that out here, and then we're going to break it down a little bit.
So I kind of want to explain what they're trying to get at by summarizing critical theory in, or critical race theory in this way. The first thing that we need to do if we're going to understand critical race theory is we need to understand how it differs from the traditional civil rights movement. So the traditional civil rights movement, one of its key features, or rather one of its key strategies, was trying to establish equal, right, equal rights for the non-white races by appealing to the common humanity that we all share and experience, right? If you go back and if you look at pictures of protesters in the civil rights movement, you'll see pictures of, for example, a black man holding a uh, sign that says, I am a man, appealing to the common humanity that both black people and white people participate in. That's not how critical race theory is trying to establish social justice. They're not going to appeal to the common humanity that all the races participate in. Rather, they're going to take race, they're going to lean it into it, they're going to emphasize the differences between the races and the, the difference in treatment that the different races experience and they're going to try to establish social justice by leaning into the difference rather than leaning into the ways in which we are the same. So that's what they're trying to get at with this first clause, unlike traditional civil rights. Let's go on. Which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress. How was the civil rights movement successful? Well, it took some time, and it occurred incrementally through step-by-step -step progress. It wasn't an all-or-nothing thing right away, but it relied on the legal structures of the United States and continued effort and protest to slowly but surely establish uh, rights for black people. Critical race theory is not interested in trying to establish social justice by going through the traditional, legal, liberalistic channels. They think that this idea that uh, reform is possible or social justice is possible by engaging in step-by-step -step progress through reform, that's not going to do it. Because society is ultimately, they think, racist to the core, and so reform isn't going to change the state of affairs. What we need to do, rather, is destroy, dismantle this whole thing, and start from the ground up. So they're not interested in appealing to the legal order uh, like you would in a normal liberal society to try to get things done. They want to, as they say, disrupt and dismantle the system and rebuild it from the ground up because it can't really be saved. It explains this in the next clause here. Critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, the very ideas on which our liberal society is based. One of those ideas is equality theory. They're gonna say no, equality theory, equality under the law actually isn't a good thing because what equality under the law ends up doing is it doesn't produce change quickly enough and by appealing to equality under the law, that doesn't ameliorate any of the historical injustices that black people have faced and that continue to uh, affect them and impact them, like slavery or redlining. These kinds of um, practices, they're not going to be done away with or, or the effects that they generate unfairly on black people are not going to be done away with by trying to lean into equality theory. Because if we're all equal under the law, and if we all just treat each other the same, we're not going to be fixing, or we're not going to be establishing justice for past wrongdoings. Does that make sense? So for example, they're going to say, you don't get reparations from equality theory. So you can't lean into equality theory. That's not something that is going to be good for black people generally. They question legal reasoning. 
They don't think that legal reasoning is neutral or fair, but rather racist ideas and biases are baked into the law. It's structural. They question enlightenment rationalism. This idea that reason is good and should be privileged as the way of organizing society and obtaining knowledge. Because look at where enlightenment rationalism got us. It got us all those fake race sciences. Enlightenment rationalism is partly responsible for slavery. It's partly responsible for the Atlantic slave trade. It's responsible for the structures that we have today that disadvantage black people and advantage white people. So enlightenment rationalism isn't really a good thing either. It's just a vehicle for oppression. And finally, the quote says, they question the neutral principles of constitutional law. When the Declaration of Independence says, for example, that all men are created equal, the critical race theorists don't buy that's what the founders actually thought or believed. Because they're going to say, look at the way black people have been treated in this country, even since its founding. They've been treated like shit. So obviously the Constitution is not neutral. It doesn't have neutral principles. The principles are actually based on implicit or tacit biases against non-white people. So they're going to question the very foundations of our liberal society because, again, they think that the racism and the biases, they go to the core. And we're not going to be able to do away with them unless we get rid of the whole thing and start something new from the ground up. Does what I just said make sense? OK. Now, another thing that critical race theory does is it questions whether actual progress has been made on racial issues. And this is really important. When Derrick Bell, who is kind of cited as one of the founders of critical race theory, was doing his work in the 1970s at Harvard Law School, he made a, some famous arguments about the idea that racism, real racial progress actually hasn't occurred. It's just found better ways to hide itself. And furthermore, that there's this idea that if racial progress does occur, it's only because it's beneficial to white people that that happens. This concept is called interest convergence. The idea that one, not much if any racial progress has been made, and two, that if racial progress has been made, it's only been made because it's been good for white people. So for example, one of the arguments that Derrick Bell makes in his law articles is that one of the primary reasons why the Civil Rights Act was passed was that the United States was just trying to make itself look good to other countries. That the United States, and white people by and large, participated in racial progress only so that the United States would it look as bad as some of the communist or third world countries that it criticizes and polices? So critical race theory fundamentally questions, one, whether or not racial progress has been made, and two, what that progress actually looks like. How, how much progress actually has been made. Because it thinks fundamentally that the racism hasn't gone away, it's baked into the structures of society. And so when we think racial progress has been made, that's probably not the case. <clears throat>
and we need to look a little deeper. If you have the text in front of you, they say a little bit something about the prevalence of racism in society. on page 10. Let me see if I can find it. I actually pulled up the wrong reading here. Pulling it up now. Okay. On the bottom of page nine, it starts with this subsection. How much racism is there in the world? Many modern day readers believe that racism is declining or that race today is more, or that class today is more important than race. And it is certainly true that lynching and other shocking expressions of racism are less frequent than in the past. Moreover, many Euro-Americans consider themselves to have black, Latino, Latina, or Asian friends. Still, by every social indicator, racism continues to blight the lives of people of color, including holders of high echelon jobs even judges. Skipping down. Studies show that blacks and Latinos who seek loans, apartments, or jobs are much more apt than similarly qualified whites to be rejected, often for vague or spurious reasons. The prison population is largely black and brown. Chief executive officers, surgeons, and university presidents are almost all white. Poverty, however, has a black or brown face. Black families have, on the average, about one-tenth of the assets of their white counterparts. They pay more for many products and services, including cars. People of color lead shorter lives, receive worse medical care, complete fewer years of school, and occupy more menial jobs than do whites. A recent United Nations report showed that African Americans in the United States would make up the 27th ranked nation in the world on a combined index of social well-being. Latinos would rank 33rd. Why all of this is so, and the relationship between racism and economic oppression, between class and race, are topics of great interest to critical race theory and will be covered later in this book. So again, we kind of see this thread, this implication running through those paragraphs, that they're questioning this idea that racial progress has actually been made. Because by every social indicator, white people seem to have more resources and advantages than other races in this country. Now, another one of the key concepts of critical race theory that has to do with all this stuff and kind of puts it in perspective is their idea of systemic racism. This is going to form the backbone of how they conceptualize racism in society and what they consider to be racist actions. before systemic racism? Can, they, can you define it? Can anybody define it? It's just racism that the system is uh, built up on has been more um, people of color or broke and in poverty than people. Right. Systemic racism, and, and I'll go even further than that because CRT goes further than that. 
The concept of systemic racism basically says this. It's the view that racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society, present in all interactions, institutions, and phenomena. As Robin D'Angelo says in this book, White Fragility, and this is about a quote, the question is not, did racism occur, but how did racism manifest in that situation? So critical race theorists believe that racism is kind of diffused throughout society, and it's baked into the different social structures and institutions that we have. It's almost everywhere. Racist actions, therefore, are not abnormal or out of the ordinary or few and far between, but rather they're present in all interactions, institutions, and phenomena. Going along with this concept of systemic racism is an implication of what this means for black people. It's the idea of structural determinism. Structural determinism is the view that structures in society determine life outcomes. So for example, because of the fact that black households on average have less wealth than their white counterparts because of the legacy of slavery, and because of the fact that white families have for hundreds of years been able to pass wealth down to their families, and that always that hasn't been an option for black people, at least until you know slavery was outlawed, because of redlining because of Jim Crow laws and their legacy, it has created a society that is racist to the core and that largely determines whether or not you're going to succeed in life. So the critical race theorists would say something like, if you are a white, middle class boy and you're raised in a nice suburban neighborhood, you're almost guaranteed to be successful and land on your feet and be fine. But if you're a poor black boy who's being raised in a really poor neighborhood where there's violence and crime, the deck is stacked against you and you're pretty much screwed from the get-go. You're almost determined to have a shitty, disadvantaged life. This is the idea of structural determinism. Going along with this idea is the view that because society is by and large organized by 
and created for white people, that white people have a certain privilege that members of other races do not have. They have certain advantages just uh, for reason of passing as white. So white privilege is the view that white people have privilege in society in virtue of having light-looking skin, in virtue of passing as white. Because again, there are deep biases present in human psychology, and because the system is set up in a certain way to advantage white people and disadvantage non-white. So what are some examples of white privilege? Can anyone give any? Job opportunities. Say more about that, yeah. Um, so like, in some cases, it's going through all these resumes, and like, you know, if two of them have the same one as like a very white looking name, and somebody has like a non white looking name, like, or like a traditional one Japanese name, Either consciously or unconsciously, you like on this one, you know, over the other one. Right. There have been studies that they've done about managers and other higher ups in companies looking at resumes, and even with resumes that have the same qualifications, the higher ups or the managers tend to choose the one that has the whiter sounding name, even if the qualifications are the same on the resume. So the critical race theorists are going to look at this and say, look, that's, that's an example of white privilege. White people have privilege that other races don't have. How about interactions with police? Do I have to worry about being shot by the police? How about compared to a black man? The critical race theorists are going to say, white people generally don't have to worry about the police and their interactions with them. But black people, on the other hand, experience discrimination from police. And so when they do have to deal with police, it's always a little iffy what's going to happen. That's, a, that's another example of white privilege. If I'm walking down the street in the middle of the night, let's say with this outfit on, my cardigan on, I'm generally not seen as a threat by other people. But if you're walking down the street and you're walking on the same side of the street, you're seeing a, a big black man approaching you. Are you going to be a little nervous or, or wary? Are you going to see them as a threat? That's another example of white privilege. According to the critical race theorists, I don't have to be worried about being perceived as a threat. But that's an obstacle or a disadvantage that black people face. And I'll give one more. In school, I have the privilege of being taught my own history. What do you get taught in history classes in grade school or elementary school? You get taught white European history, right? You get taught about white explorers, about Columbus. Black people don't have the privilege, by and large, of being taught their own history or a lot of events that are important in black history are excluded from textbooks or excluded from lesson plans. So that's another example that critical race theorists will point to as white privilege. 
There's also this concept of whiteness in CRT. And this is an interesting concept. Whiteness is supposed to denote the specific dimensions of racism that elevate whites over people of color, unfairly granting them rights, resources, and experiences that are denied to non-whites. Now is a good time to bring up another key part of critical race theory, which is the idea that, again, because race is a social construction, there's a difference between being racially black and politically black. Some critical race theorists will say that if you work hard, if you try to speak like the white man, if you try to play the white man's game, you're not politically black. You're participating in whiteness. Because you're not trying to undermine the structures that are repressing non-white social groups, you're playing into it, and you're re-legitimizing them and reproducing those structures. I want to read a uh, encyclopedia entry to you on whiteness, so you can get a sense of what whiteness is and how it is manifest in this way. This is from the New Discourses website on whiteness. Whiteness in critical social justice is to be understood as the defining property of being classified as white, socially. Being classified as white socially, according to the social constructivist understanding of race. Whiteness is therefore also the property in terms of social and institutional status and identity imbued with legal, political, economic, and social rights and privileges that are denied to others, that white people have unjust access to in virtue of being classified as white. It is therefore also connected to the stance of white supremacy, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which roughly means a belief that white people deserve these unjust advantages for whatever set of reasons. White people are believed to be inherently invested in whiteness, those aspects of society that continue to advantage white people, by having been socialized to accept it as normal and good and to enjoy its benefits. Privilege. A great deal of critical race theory is dedicated to describing how white people are invested in whiteness and work to keep it including a myriad of concepts like white comfort, white complicity, white fragility, white ignorance, and white solidarity. As with everything in the theory of social justice, whiteness has to be understood as a socially constructed system of power that is ultimately self-interested whether by intention or by merely corrupting the influence of privilege that defines and maintains white dominance and the oppression of people of color. 
Thus, critical race theory insists whiteness must be critically examined and dismantled. Whiteness is believed to be the foundation of the hegemonic force in society that critical race theory exists to unmake. Whiteness is something, the entry goes on to say, that all white people are allegedly complicit in and trained in and uh, socialized into because the system seeks to reproduce itself and to keep other social groups out of positions of power. Okay, I just threw a lot of information at you. Do you have any questions about this stuff right here? This is kind of a messy concept and it's kind of complex. I'm probably not gonna test you on that. Yeah, I kind of just have a little opinion, uh, especially on the structural um, determination. And I'm trying to keep in mind that this is from 1914. So um, basically in 2021, I believe that you know, a white person can start off structurally with the same aspects of a uh, black person. Because like I was raised in like a trailer park and like very, very poor, very broke and I went to a high school that was mostly black people and all that. So I believe that nowadays a person that's white, like they do still have all those privileges with like the job opportunities and the police and stuff. But, but when it comes to like the class system now that a white person can start off at the same place as a black person. And I feel like they're kind of arguing that, that you know, since you're white, you automatically get food spread Right. The the critical race theorists are still going to hold on to that view, though. Yeah. They're going to say that it doesn't matter if you're a poor white person or a rich white person. You have privileges that other members in society don't. And they'll say that if you actually do have a belief that if you work hard, you can succeed and the future is open to you, that's actually an internalized racism, which is kind of a controversial view, right? Yeah, so they would say that if, if you have this belief that progress should be made by step-by-step -step progress and that the law is actually equal to people, enlightenment rationalism should be privileged, and if you think that if you work hard, no matter your race, you can be successful. That's actually a form of internalized racism. And that you're not seeing things clearly, actually. You're not woke. You haven't been awoke, awakened to critical consciousness yet. Because they see the system as set up against non-white people. So working hard isn't... Uh, trying to play into the meritocracy is just going to reproduce this oppressive system. Which again, it's, it's a claim that I think we can discuss, probably, especially when we get to the end of class here. But let me just keep going. I can get the rest of the concepts out on the table, and then we can discuss them. If I was going to summarize critical race theory in one line, its purpose, its goals, it would be this. I shouldn't have erased this, this is actually. Critical race theory attempts to locate racism in society, root it out, make up for historical injustices, and establish equity between the social groups.
concept of equity is very important for understanding critical race theory. Because equity is not the same as equality. Generally, when we think of equality, we think everyone has the same opportunity to succeed, right? The critical race theorists do not like that. First of all, because they don't think it's true. And second of all, because the discrepancies between social groups in terms of capital, resources, access to the means of production, all of those are influenced and determined by the racism that's in society. So they're going to say, if a black family has less money than a white family, that's because of racism. And so this idea of trying to make sure everybody has the same opportunity doesn't fix anything. What we need to do is we need to establish equity. Equity is making it so that everyone has the same outcome. They see, again, all discrepancies uh, in wealth, in quality of life, as caused by racism and historical injustices. So they want to make it so that actually everybody has the same stuff. Everybody has the same wealth. Everybody has the same access to resources. Everybody has the same quality of life after we make up for historical injustices, like engaging in reparations, for example. You can see now why I was arguing at the beginning of this unit that critical theory is a synthesis of Marxism and postmodernism, right? This is a very kind of Marxist concept, right? The idea that everybody has the same stuff. Do you remember what Marxism wanted to do for capital and society? It wanted to redistribute it so everybody had what they needed, right? That's what this is basically getting at, equity. The way they define racism also is very different from probably the definition that you grew up with. One of the first criterions of racism is that it's a function of prejudice plus power. What that means is if someone says something discriminatory to a white person, that's not racist because white people hold the social and institutional power in society. White people can be racist against non-white people, but non-white people can't be racist to white people because they don't hold any of the social and institutional power. Non-white people might be prejudiced towards white people, but that's not racism, they argue. Racism needs to be backed up for it to be racism, social and institutional power. And they define race something as racist generally is that which sustains or produces inequity between the social groups. This is where we start getting into kind of a little more controversial domain. Is buying something off Amazon racist? What do you think? Probably, yeah. <laughs> According to this definition, it's racist. Why would it be racist? 
you're contributing towards sustaining or producing inequity between the social groups. Do you think Jeff Bezos is going to donate a bunch of money to the black community? No. You're putting money in a white guy's pocket. You're not making things more equal between the racial groups. You're either sustaining it by buying something off Amazon or widening the gap. So buying something off Amazon, for example, can be considered racist. Or buying a latte at Starbucks. Anything that sustains or produces inequity is racist. What do you all think about that definition? I agree with these terms, and I have no issue with them. It's obviously not the common parlance use of racist as we use it in everyday life, but as a as a concept of identifying. Um, because if you call something like I've heard the phrase like, and this is something I find to be incredibly stupid, but reverse racism, right. which is like uh, some like some people's idea of oh well if you're uh, you know like racist against a white person and it's like well that's not what that really like it doesn't really line up with what you're just describing is um, it just seems like this is a like the, what you said earlier about um, like yeah you can be prejudiced towards a white person but that uh, under the the this definition would not be racist because it doesn't have the power behind it. Like that, right. makes, that makes perfect sense. That's just like a perfect way to explain this definition. Like there's nothing I can really point to to say like, oh, well, it shouldn't be that way. Now, as far as like using this as a, like getting it kind of out there, that would be difficult like to. Yeah, keep, keep going. Yeah, like. Uh, like implementing this into everyday conversation, uh, I'm not sure how that would go over. Like, imagine having to explain to someone over 50 that they're racist. You know, like right by going to the hardware racist. store and, and then like, we know yeah. that there's an asterisk. Like, it's not like because you know there are some things that we feel that we have to participate in, which under this definition would be considered, you know, like maybe attending this college. Or attending this, this college is arguably <laughs> racist, right? Yeah. yeah. Like it, it falls, you know, like it, it's that broad, but it's not, and it is bad, but it's not like, um, it's kind of the individualist argument of like, uh, should I recycle if most of that stuff is going to go to the landfill? Mm. Anyway. Yeah, I want to say one thing and then I'll get to you. One thing you'll hear critical race theorists say is impact over intention. And this really gets across what their definition of racism is. Because the old definition of racism involved someone having or espousing a view that one race is superior to another, and they essentialized the group. Right? There's this idea that when you make a racist remark or you're a racist, According to the old definition, you think one race is superior than another, and there's part of it that the group that you're racist towards, you are stereotyping them in a sense. This is different. This puts the criterion of whether something is racist or not on the consequence of your action. It has nothing to do with your beliefs or intentions. So even if you don't intend to be racist, even if you don't believe that white people are superior to black people, if you act in a way that sustains or produces inequity, they're going to say that's racist regardless of what you believe. In this way, their definition of racism is consequentialist. Whereas before, we might say the old definition was more deontological, it had more to do with your intention or your belief. Right? This one is purely consequentialist. Yeah, what are you going to say? I'm just going to say, like, I agree, Patrick, with like, all these concepts and theories. And like, the point you were making about um, stuff being, like, buying something off Amazon being like, racist, doesn't that kind of like circle back to like, capitalism being kind of problematic? Because I feel like 
Amazon has become so like essential to the collective that we all have kind of no choice but to buy from Amazon, if that makes sense. Yeah. So like, you know, like how are we supposed to kind of like balance that? I mean, I agree with it, but I just feel like it's become so big that we have kind of no choice but to use Amazon. So right. So but it kind of circles back to like capitalism being kind of an issue, if that makes sense. Right. Well, yeah, one of the big criticisms that the critical race theorists are gonna have of society is our capitalist economic system. Right, because they're going to say, look, capitalism is fine if we all start off in the same place, but we didn't all start off in the same place, did we? Because of the legacy of racism and Jim Crow laws, white people have had a leg up for centuries. So this capitalist system is also bad and needs to go. So you're right in honing in on that. They're also going to ruthlessly critique capitalism. Because they also think capitalism is per is uh, sustaining and producing inequity between the social groups. It's one of the vehicles for that. Let me write down another concept here for you. What it means to be anti-racist. If that which is racist is anything that sustains or produces inequity, what do you think anti-racist is? Yeah. Right. That which eliminates inequity between the racial groups. In his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ibram X. Kendi says, you're either a racist or an anti-racist. There is no being non-racist. Because if you're colorblind, what are you doing? You're sustaining the inequity, right? If you're colorblind, you're merely sustaining the system, keeping the system as it is. And the system as it is right now is oppressive. So you're either racist or you're anti-racist. There's no middle ground. What it means to be anti-racist is to act in ways that eliminates the inequity between the racial groups. And if you're not doing that, what you're doing is racist. This brings us to the concept of what it means to be white supremacist which again has changed probably from what you think the definition is. We used to think somebody who is a white supremacist is like a KKK member, right? They have these awful racial views, they you know, engage in these horrible racial practices, racist practices, but that's not what it means to be a white supremacist anymore. Because that which is racist is defined as that which sustains or produces inequity, and the system that we have was built by and for white people, if you support the status quo, that makes you a white supremacist. And the reason this makes you a white supremacist is because the status quo is designed to advantage white people and disadvantage non-white people. If you're just going along with what everybody else is, if you got your nine to five job, if you buy from Amazon, you get your lattes in the morning, you are engaging in actions that are white supremacist. Because these actions maintain or increase the inequity between the racial groups.
And to bring up one more concept, and this is key for understanding critical race theory, how critical race theory um, argues we should change our practices and beliefs so that we're anti-racist. I want to read from you a quote from his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, from Ibram X. Kennedy. This is on page 19, if you happen to have the book. Racial discrimination is not inherently racist. The defining question is whether the discrimination is creating equity or inequity. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. And here's the kicker. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. So according to Kennedy, and according to the critical race theorists, if we want to be anti-racist, we need to discriminate against white people. Because it's only by discriminating against white people that we can change the system. Affirmative action is an example of that, right? They're going to say we need more affirmative action programs, we need reparations, we need more programs that um, privilege black people and other races, other non-white races, to make things more fair and to make up for the historical injustices that black people and other non-whites have faced in this country. And remember, discrimination according to these definitions is not necessarily racist. Because since white people are the ones who hold the social and institutional power, only white people can be racist in society. There's a lot of information at you. Do you want to have a discussion about this? Do you all agree with this? Do you disagree? You disagree? I'm guessing with this quote right here. Well, okay. So I'd like to say two things to that. I'm gonna play devil's advocate. I'm gonna I'm gonna be on the side of critical race theory, okay? They're going to say you're not racist because of the color of your skin. You're racist because of the actions you engage in. So buying that latte, you know, buying off Amazon, that's what makes you racist. It's not your white skin. It's the actions. So your niece is only racist if she does racist stuff. Yeah, but to go to the elementary school, that's probably right. And also, right. I do believe that some uh, black people can be racist towards white people too, because like I've experienced that in the South. Like I used to get bullied by like black girls and stuff because they would like to have their group, and then you know they would bully white girls, and it would be a thing. And you know, there's also some black girls or guys with more money that like to bully like white kids that are broke. And the same vice versa. So I don't automatically think that, you know, one is better than the other. I think we're mostly equal now, except for when it comes to like the police system and the um, capital system and like the money system and the job system. But that's like a whole different side of society than just how we view each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, yeah, so, so that's the thing. One, they're going to say it's likely that as a white person, you do have bias deep inside you that you need to root out. And the only way to do that is by 
critically engaging with your whiteness. But then they're also going to say, even if you don't have any prejudicial beliefs or views, in virtue of just playing into the system, you're being racist. Because the, race, the, the system is designed to, to disadvantage non-white people. That's one of the basic premises of their view. So even if you don't hold racist beliefs, you're still a racist if you're contributing to or playing into how things are right now and keeping the system going. Yeah, like I, I, I've heard a lot of the, uh, I suppose a lot of the pushback uh, against this being implemented in, say, schools, because that's the, that's the hot topic right now. Is that, right. Like, how do I explain to a child, like, uh, that they are inherently bad or something like that or something? And I'd say this um, bypasses that in a way that is, um, because as, as we've established, it's not about attention. It's about, uh, in, uh, in an oversimplified way, society is racist and we are part of society. Right. We contribute to that. And so um, it kind of puts uh, anti-racism at a, at a higher achievement. At a, like it is a, it is a harder, it describes it as a harder, more difficult thing to do, which is probably good because as things are, the way we think of anti-racism now, kind of in our average everyday lives, aside from this, perhaps it's in too comfortable of a, um, a pedestal. Perhaps a lot of us think that we are anti-racists, yet we contribute to that status quo. Right, right. We think that we're, ra we're anti-racist maybe, but the critical race theorists say no, you think you're actually non-racist, which means you're racist. Because, you know, you're not... Because in, impl in implementation, like, what does intention really do? Like, if, if things are still bad, right? Right, yeah. If things are still bad, then, uh, then we have to start looking at the consequences to our actions. We can't just keep saying, well, you know, we're trying, and we're, our hearts are in the right place. Like, if, if we keep thinking that, and then still, you know, things, you know, never change, then I suppose that's, that's my view on this. Okay. Yeah. I feel like a big thing with this, because, like, I agree with this. Like, I see what all this is saying, but I feel like poor white people have to understand that they're not poor because of the color of their skin, if that makes sense. Like, them being white isn't what makes them poor. Whereas for like a black person, because of the system, it's kind of contributed into that. I feel like that's kind of what they're okay. trying to say. You know what I mean? It's that yeah. Sense. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah I, I feel like that they feel like it's the same thing, but it's not. Like, even though you're a poor white person, you still have white privilege. So being, yeah, you're poor, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with you being white. Right. Yeah, so, so that actually brings up a good question. Do the majority and, and the critical race theorists are going to have a definitive answer on this? But do the majority of problems that non-white people face, is it racial or is it class? It's class. That's what I think they're trying to say. They're, they're going to say that it's class because it's racial. I mean, if, any, if there is anything that I would yeah. disagree with in, in regards to this, it would be, I would put a little more emphasis on class because um, like I don't, you know, like I don't feel really comfortable saying to like a like a poor white child that's like, oh no, it's it's not, uh, you know, you're not poor because of an, any inherent, you know, like you, you know, like a, if I, uh, what, what am I trying to say? Uh, what, what what did you say? Is there you, 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 as far no, as no, like, what you're trying to say? What you're yeah. trying to say? I'm gonna get it. I'll get you there. Going to. You're poor because of bad choices you made, not because you're black. Yeah, like you're I, poor white. I would never because you're want bad, to. You're, you made bad financial decisions that launched you in that situation that does not have anything to do with your color at all. Whereas a black person in the same similar financial situation is there systemically because the system is set up for them to be there. So it's not the same thing like 
you're on the same playing field because right. if I just made, in addition to making, if I make the same decisions that you made, I would still be way, way lower on this particular thing. I mean, I said, let's try it. Let's actually try this. Let's try this. Let's go tell the little kid. Well, black kids have been told their whole life. They don't want to, they want to like, it's, I'm laughing because it's just like, this ain't gonna start, but they're really gonna try to influence this in the public school. They want to actually walk in there and tell like, yeah, like maybe her five-year-old niece, like, you know why you're racist? Because you actually think you have a black friend. Instead of just saying that's my friend. You don't know that what you just said is so racist mm. because you've been doing it so long that you are distinguishing that these two five-year-olds one is a white kid and one is a black kid. And people that are, mm. are, are, are non-white sit back and we hear that and you don't know that you're being racist. So it's like until you can get down to that root and rip that from the root, it's going to keep happening and it's still going to be like, like I said, he said earlier, like my heart is in the right place. I wasn't trying to be, but you can't see it because you're really not trying to be. You are you are, you are, you are. That, that's actually really interesting you'd say that because the, the critical race theorists think color blindness is really bad. Yeah. They're, they're going to say acting, being colorblind is racist. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not being colorblind, I'm talking about the ideal that I am in some way a good person because I socialize oh. with other people that are not my. Color. Right. That does not make you like a good person if I have a black friend or I have black roommates or I have what? When people say that they don't understand how racist that really is for you to even be able to make that that's my friend. Not that I'm colorblind, but that the color, that's not the issue there. I like this person because we're on the same level as far as intellectually, we have the same likes, we have you know those types of things. I mean I, I get what you're saying, like you know, it's worth like it's just not the same. It's not, and I feel like at the end of the day, we have to circle back to once again, like capitalism being the issue. Like a poor white person doesn't need to like try to associate them being poor necessarily with race. They need to solely kind of focus on the system. You know what I mean? Like I like this because the system is set up this way kind of for all of us in a way. If you're not like, what is that, the top 10% or the top 1%, like the rest of us are kind of struggling. So you kind of have to like, Separated out, it has nothing to do with my race. It's solely the system. It's just like how the system is set up. And so critical theory, racial theory, they, they want to say, okay, let's knock down, from my understanding, let's knock down all this, this trying to get it right, because you cannot get this right. Let's go to the root and start from like in public schools and tell the children, black and white, who they are and what what's going on in them. So they want to tell five girls, like, you know, Hey, because your ancestors enslaved people, you have a inherent advantage and privilege that you are going to use and that you use daily, even if you don't know it. And that is racist. So you are racist. And their ideal is to try to teach the, the, the racist people that they are racist so that they can start growing with that knowledge and then try to undo it as they grow. Is, is that my understanding that like they live on, they're trying to get to the root. So the younger you are, older people have their mindset, but they, they're trying to get down to the younger children and say, hey, you are racist simply because you're white and everything that your parents and grandparents have brought into in life to give you those privileges because of the color of your skin. Now it goes in your court to fix that. That, that, that's so that's one part of it but there's also this uh, revolutionary aspect that we also need to keep in mind because they don't think that we're going to be able to fix this the system through reform we need to destroy the whole thing so yeah is that are y'all on board with that do we need to tear everything down and start that's the, the only uh, concern that I have is if you try to teach this with some kind of compromise, like because if you if you teach this to say someone young and impressionable, but they also then believe in maybe let's say meritocracy, like what if a what if like a poor white child goes like, well I do have like white privilege and I understand this, but then I'm also 
poor and like my my hard work uh, like is is guaranteed to to bring me something. So I must just be bad. When if you if you teach that's what I mean. If you teach it in a in a vacuum, then like separate from like other uh, critical theory, like you know like being critical of society and capitalism in general, then it just kind of comes down to that. That's what I think opponents of this are missing, is this idea that like, no, it's not just this that is the, like, anything that they say against this kind of is answered by something else entirely. Okay. But it's impossible. Under, under the critical theory, it's impossible for you to have the argument that Regardless, yeah, okay, I may be white, okay, and I, I may have some kind of privilege, but I work hard. And right. because I work hard, you know, merit, merit, the, the merit of my work got me to where I am. The critical race theory is saying, no, that's not true. That there is foundational, specifically, systems set in place that influence that as well. Influence right. that as well. Right. So no, there is no merit. And the idea of like, okay, so to balance out all these years and structural damage done for due to racism is to be racist towards them. That means to single them out, to criticize that part which makes the system continuously work this right. way. Right. Yeah. Is is indeed knocking down the system. It's knocking that system down by reinforcing the the emphasis on whiteness and on the privilege of whiteness and on white supremacy and that everything you have is because of white supremacy, it's because of the racism, it's because of the races that you created to benefit yourself. All of that is what you have acquired over the generation. It came from that. So is it that now if we be racist, I keep laughing at some funny people, but be racist towards white people, will they now start to feel and understand what it is to be treated a different kind of way because of the color of their skin that is not beneficial to them? Right, so that, that brings us to this. I mean, do we, do we think that he is right? Do we think that the way out of this is to discriminate against white people? trying to say it's not discrimination, it's just giving other races a leg up. Kind of. I, I don't remember the term, but there's this like, I think this sort of a, talks about this in the reading, but like, whenever we are like, oh, all non-whites are, you know, have this down, you sort of elevate whiteness above where it's actually at. You know what I mean? Interesting. Okay. So, like, you have to take that down a little bit and just be like, you are not, you know, as as much of a shit as you think you are because you have this, because you've been treated with this privilege kind of a thing. So it's not necessarily like discrimination. It's more of just like take it off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. kind of like, I think relative to what white people expect, it would be discrimination and a kind of like yeah. not relative to what everybody else on the planet is experiencing, like to. To them, the people in a position not of power, it isn't discrimination. Like equity is just, it is just that leg up. But um, you know, if you if you tell like uh, someone rich and powerful and white, like you know all of this, then you're going to get a lot of whining and a lot of like, oh, but you know, yeah, like it's it's going to be seen and not, it's not going to go over. Uh, it, it, and, 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 I, I think it would be maybe, you know, discrimination would be tossed around as a sort of Absolutely. Like, I guess it's, it's definitely it's like saying, okay, okay, we're going to take, okay, we're going to take the money off the table. Okay, we're going to take the money off the table. We're just going 
want to say, even if you have no money, that you will be discriminated against. You got to understand discrimination. Discrimination has nothing to do with things pocket. I mean, if you think back to any of these civil rights, I was sitting at this the counter. It wasn't that you know, say Martin Luther King, and he's always the famous one to go to, so they go to him. It wasn't that Martin Luther King went to the counters and said, "Hey, give me a free cup of coffee and give me a free piece of pie out your <laughs> store." He had the money in his pocket. He was willing to pay to get the cup of coffee, old, and he was willing to pay to get the piece of pie, white pie, right? It had nothing to do with money. It had simply to do with the fact that you're black. And no, even if you have a million dollars, you're gonna have to go way down the street to the black only pie because you cannot have it here by white only pie. And so the critical race reform what I'm getting is saying, no, we're not gonna sugarcoat this. We're not gonna make this feel good. We're not trying to make you okay with this theory. We're saying right. that this is what it is, this is what it has been, and we think that you have Benefit for this long enough for you to put your big girl or big guy panties on your boxes on and say, hey, for the next forever. <laughs> uh, what? We're just going to treat you in a discriminatory manner because you're white. And then that treatment will balance out eventually to where black people will be what? in this much power. <laughs> Right, so, so that is that is one of the key parts is because of the legacy of the oppression black people have faced, we need to make up for that by discrimination in the present. I mean, that's what Kendi says. And so when you think about things like um, hiring, I mean, what would you call it if a manager said, no, we already have three white people working for us, can't hire any more white people. Isn't that discrimination? The only question is whether or not that discrimination is just, right? That's the main issue. And another one of the controversial aspects of this is this statement right here, which is linked to this concept of structural determinism. Because structural determinism is going to argue that if you're someone who's not white and you don't succeed, it's not your fault, though. Is that true? It's, it's a touchy subject, right? They, they're going to say, no, it's. Um, like, what if you're born into a disadvantage because of what your parents or your family did? That has nothing to do with you. Right. Well, they'll probably say something like, the reason that happened to your family was because the system was set up against them. So if you, tr you trace it back far enough, you'll find the racism. You know, or the. So, this is being discussed a lot right now. This is becoming more popular in the culture, in society. So, I think it's the reason I bring it up is because I think it's important that you understand what they're saying and what their basic premises are. Because when you hear words nowadays like racist or anti racist or white supremacist, these are the definitions that they're operating under now. The definitions aren't the same ones that you may have grown up with. Definitely wasn't the one I grew up with. So the language has changed a little bit, but the basic idea is that we're changing how we talk about these things so that we can expose the oppression that non-white people face and try to root it out. That's the whole purpose behind it. And advocates for not reform, but just completely um, like leveling it and then rebuilding. Re it. A lot of critical race theorists are going to say we need to do reparations to make up for past wrongs, and then we need to redistribute all of the resources in the world. Because any discrepancy, any wealth discrepancy, any quality of life discrepancy, any service discrepancy is because of racism or oppression. So if you do experience a, a discrepancy like that and you're not white, it's not your fault. It's because that's the way the system is. 
So we did. We need to change the system entirely. And what happens after that? We live under communism, I guess. And everything is great. <laughs> if you talk to critical race theorists, the vast majority of them are communists. What's interesting about the discussions about um, this being implemented into um, some kind of like like a uh, like a uh, like making this essential within like K through 12 curriculum um, is it is against the system in an overt almost overt yeah yeah, yeah it definitely so is yeah how, yeah, yeah. Like how would this be taught in within the system that it is advocating against like yeah and I'm not even disagreeing yeah. with it in that yeah. aspect I'm just uh, asking like yeah like how would that work if this well, was like so so yeah one of the the opponents of critical race theory will say you can't teach this because this is racist it's not racist it's discrimination well they're they're going to say it's racist because they're not going with this definition right they're going with the the essentialization the idea that one racial group is superior to another you know They'll definitely say it's discriminatory, if not racist. How long do you think this is going to be? I have no idea. I mean, as a professor, as, a, as an instructor, like, okay, it's in the curriculum, you need to teach it to us, right? Yeah. Like, how long do you think this is going to be? It was my decision to teach it, actually. But it's an option, right? They're not going to come in. The president of the school is not going to come like, hey, what are you going to teach it in, right? No, it's not. Right now, it's not being required by professors to do it. What is being required, though, for federal employees and if you go to college nowadays, and almost any college, is racial sensitivity training, which is the bare bones of this stuff. Or what they might call culturally responsive education, which is the bare bones of this stuff. So what are they trying to teach inside the elementary schools compared to what we just find that now? Is it the exact same curriculum, or is it something a little bit like you know, ABC-ish? It, it's it's ABC-ish. Teach um, it's, it's ABC-ish, but it is the bare bones of this stuff, and it's called Critical Race Praxis. The tradition that critical race theory comes from, which again is a synthesis of postmodernism and neo-Marxism, the Marxists have this idea that you have theory, which is what we're looking at today, we're just looking at all theory, and then you have practice, which is actually you know, what you do in the outside world. And when your theory matches up, when, when, when your actions match up with the theory, what you're engaging in is praxis. So in a lot of schools, they're teaching the actions or the strategies, the anti-racist strategies. They're not giving them all of this conceptual information you know, that we're looking at. Because this is high level stuff. This is like, a lot of this stuff is taught in graduate school or in the college classroom. Yeah, like you want to sit a five year old down. And just right, you're verbatim. You have to start with something. Right. Is, yeah. Which is like the ABCs. Yeah. Okay, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Otherwise, I'll let you go on break here. Is this, does this pertain only to like Western culture, or is this like a global kind of thing? That's a great question. Um, their analysis is mostly located in Western culture. But they might lump in like um, the slavery and the oppression in the Middle East, they might also consider that whiteness. Even though, you know, Europeans are a different people than you know people who live in the Middle East, but we're we're all still considered Caucasian. So, but yeah, it's mostly this analysis is mostly leveled against Western industrial society. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll let you go on break here. Uh, please be back in ten minutes at seven forty-seven, and then we'll talk about critical gender theory.
think this is like complicated enough to the degree where I could level like a hypothetical, like a devil's advocate kind of like argument against it, and then you literally go back and point at something at the, on the board and go like, no, this is this addresses this. Right. And then it's like, oh, okay, it's it's just in there. It's it's almost like an interaction. Like I'm. Right. Like, here's you read over multiple times and you discover like, oh no, it does like figure this out. He, here's one of the tricky things about it though, and this is something that you'll encounter if you read White Fragility or How to Be an Anti-Racist. If as a white person you're accused of being racist, any rejection of that racism is taken as evidence of your racism. Yeah. So that that's where it gets a little weird. So you guys, should because that's the, that's the definition of a Kafka trap. So. You know, it's like if I if I say you stole my money, you're like I didn't steal your money. I'm like that's exactly what a stealer would say. You know, so that's why a lot of people who are opponents of this are like, this whole thing is just like, look, no, you know? no, no, for non-white. This whole thing is no for white non-white. Like so when you're not what is that what you just said? I just I accused you of stealing my stuff and I said I didn't steal your stuff and that's exactly what. That is the normal day for a black person. Okay, they ask what the curve You know, like you're just too, driving yeah. in your car, and like all these people are just getting stopped and shot. They're not just getting stopped and shot. There was a dialogue that went on first. There was some words that were exchanged, and it was just like, no, you're wrong, and I'm dead. So this is like the ideal of like, I think about, I keep laughing, I keep thinking about David Chappelle. And he did this whole like, white frequency thing. It keeps coming to my head. I mean, I listen to this because he was so ahead of his time with it. Like, you know. Got it. Uh, just a final exam. Um, your fourth reading response on this unit is due on Sunday. But if you need an extension, let me know. Yeah. After you, one day or many days. 